Hello and welcome to Food and Dine. This is a Top Chef podcast. My name is Quiche. And my name is Miyuki. And this week we will be discussing Top Chef Season 21, Episode 4, called The Right Way, which is a tribute to the architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. And to recap the episode, very briefly, as there was no quick fire challenge this week, there was only an elimination challenge. The elimination challenge was to create two dishes on the theme of duality as inspired by the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. The winning dishes in the elimination challenge was Danny and Rossica, and they did a duality of seemingly similar yet strikingly different. The dish and chefs that got sent to Last Chance Kitchen, that was Alicia and Kalina, and they did a dishes that focused on the duality of land and sea. Keish, what did you think of this episode? It stressed me out. Oh, <gasps> it stressed me out a lot. <laughs> I I think it was a fascinating choice to bring architecture into the conversation around the culinary arts, but generally the vibe was stressful. I don't know. What did you think? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to hold the bulk of my thoughts for the elimination challenge when we get there, which mm. won't be too long since there was no quick fire this week. Second time this season already. We're only four episodes in, but you know, <laughs> I do have a, have a very light, should be lightweight Top Chef baggage check, if I may step up to the Ooh, camera. Okay. I, I will have some heavier baggage mm -hmm. for a little bit later. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start it with the light stuff. We'll start it with the light. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll make it easy at the counter. Keep it light and breezy. So for this baggage check, one of the guest judges this week was Buddha Lowe, and I have mentioned him, I'm quite certain, before, as he was the winner of Top Chef Houston, that was season 19, and also the winner of Top Chef World All-Stars in London, season 20. So he won back-to-back -back seasons of Top Chef. So he is pretty much the GOAT of Top Chef. Mm. And he was also on Dish with Kish. I wouldn't normally suggest you go watch Dish with Kish. But I, I thought he made a really architectural dish on Dish with Kish, and I thought you might appreciate seeing that. So that is my my light and breezy Top Chef baggage check for today. And typically I would tell you what had happened in the quick fire. However, since there wasn't one, I'm going to instead summarize for everyone the elimination challenge. And just to refresh everyone's memory, you know, since we had to get through that quick fire first to get here, it was mm. to create two dishes inspired by the creations of the architect Frank Lloyd Wright. It had to have a theme of duality. They had to partner in teams of two. The winning team was Danny and Rossica, and they did a dish that was seemingly similar, yet strikingly different. So Danny's dish was a scallop mousse with zucchini and green chartreuse. And Rossica's dish was a daw quenelle with pickled beets, carrot puree, and rossum, her grandmother's rossum. The winner of the elimination was Rossica. Mm -hmm. So even though they were, worked in teams of two, only one dish won, and that was Rossica's dish. So Rossica wins immunity again. On the bottom, the chef testants who got sent to LCK were Alicia and Kalina. They did the land and sea duality. Alicia did an agua chili with shrimp, cucumber, and lime. And Kaylina did a mushroom and goat cheese cheesecake with a sesame twill, candied mushrooms, and spruce syrup. Keish, what did you think of the elimination challenge? I think, I mean, it lives up to the, the, the term. It's an elimination and it's a challenge. <laughs> Two people were eliminated and it was such a big challenge because, you know, as we were just talking right here, you know, you said there's no quick fire to, to describe. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that bummed me out. But then I was thinking back on the episode and there's no way they could have accomplished a quick fire challenge and everything they asked those chefs to do with the elimination challenge because they had to send them to physical locations to do research before they could even go to Whole Foods and get the food that they needed to start cooking. Mm -hmm. So it truly was like a multi-day project for these chefs. Um, I think it was a really out of the box way to see yeah. exactly how these chefs approach different challenges, mm -hmm. but you're giving them a concept. Mm -hmm. You're just giving them vibes <laughs> and you're telling them to make a dish <laughs> off the vibes. And like that, that's hard. <laughs> so it was, it was intense to watch and see these different pairings, whether they struggled, whether they gelled well, whether their ideas clashed or not. 
and hearing some of the ideas too. It's like, I'm like, oh yeah, I, I can see how you'd want to try to accomplish that, but I don't know how that's going to translate into a physical dish. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was a really interesting thing to, to see. Boy, it was a, a journey and a half though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed it was. <laughs> so there was a dish that was interesting to me. Um, I noticed in how things, how the, the chips fell at the end of this <laughs> challenge was, uh, yeah, that, um, they were all kind of just floating in this liminal space where the dishes didn't quite hit that mark or they were lacking. And there was nothing that really stood out beside Danny and Rossica's um, work together. Mm -hmm. But still, Savannah and Laura, their, their dish was interesting to me because it was taking something familiar like pistachios mm -hmm. and like the estranged cousin wild pistachios. <laughs> Like, and I was like, I've never heard of this before. I don't know what that is. And so even though, even though Savannah was like, oh, this kind of tastes like tobacco. It reminds me of my grandmother because she used to smoke. I'm still curious. Like they're still drawing me in with that concept, with that idea of like comfortable in food and uncomfortable in food. So they might not have hit the mark, but that was a dish that did stick out to me in the general challenge itself. Are there any dishes that stood out to you, Gnocchi? Honestly, uh, outside of the, the dishes in the top, I probably Kevin's dessert mm. because they said that if not for your man, Manny, I know. Ke Kevin <laughs> would have been in the top. He would have been one of the top dishes. They said that he absolutely mm -hmm. nailed it. And I actually kind of wished that. So the way it was presented was really beautiful. But the way he presented it with the, mm -hmm. the beautiful shards over the dish, I actually couldn't see what was underneath it. But I thought it was really. Yeah, they, they raved about it. So clearly that. I liked what mm -hmm. he did and he had the, they said that he nailed the textures and the color was fantastic too. Yeah. And if we're, we're basing these things off of Frank Lloyd Wright's work, then color does play such a big part in the aesthetic of the overall either building or dish. <laughs> right. And I'm also probably drawn to it because if I think of the dishes outside of the winners, even, even, even including the winners, maybe Kevin's was the most actually architectural. Mm, the judges critiqued it and like or like you know not being able to like see the dish itself that like it, it was covered and everything mm -hmm. but maybe that's this is me just reaching for kevin you know this is just me trying to help out after the fact um <laughs> months after filming months after they've already decided who won <laughs> top chef season 21 this is me just being like well what about well maybe so with that dish i could see how the the coverings the like the very geometric coverings over the dish it's kind of like when you enter into a Frank Lloyd Wright oh. house. You know, you're seeing all these geometric shapes on the outside and then you get into the inside and there's something different. There's something new that was hidden. So maybe that's what he was going for. <laughs> yes. I mean, they did say he nailed it. So yes. And actually, now that you say it that way, yeah. I, that actually, that reads to me. That absolutely reads to me. Yes. The compression and release that they were describing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. This begs the question, however, mm. what would Quiche do? Yes. What would Quiche do? <laughs> <laughs> so i would like to start out this little bit here um oh my i was totally lost <laughs> like knowing that there wasn't a quick fire i had to do the elimination i was like ah oh, this is awful <laughs> and they're like it's frank lloyd wright and i'm like he's my favorite architect but i hate this challenge <laughs> I was like, what am I supposed to, what am I, you tell me, look at a building and then go make a dish out of it? What do you mean? <laughs> so it took a lot of time for me to think about this. I will not lie. <laughs> Did this ruin your life? Hopefully this does not negatively affect your love for Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect. Oh my gosh. No, I hate him oh now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I actually, I actually discovered a new house of his that I like through this. Oh. So... I'd like to introduce you to the Elam House. It is in Austin, Minnesota. So, you know, it's subject to all the seasons, <laughs> extreme winters and nice muggy summers. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I'll describe the building a little bit to you. I wanted to look. So they they had the buildings that they chose that they showed the chef testants in the episode. But I, you know, I'm not bound to that. <laughs> so I figured I might as well see what other what other buildings there are around that Frank Lloyd Wright has designed. So this is the Elam House. Um, and it is this really beautiful, kind of like expansive home. It has a red butterfly roof, which is like one of those roofs that's kind of like a subtle V shape 
with like the point being down and in the middle, like a V shape. Oh. Yeah. Um, so like not good for when snow is on it. <laughs> no. Like the snow won't slide off. The snow will pile up. But I don't know how they solve that. But that's not why I'm here today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the red butterfly roof and it has this sandstone colored stone slash brick wall that constructs the, the rest of the house. Um, there's red horizontal wood panels and red window panes and detailing um, on the walls around these these walls that are pretty much primarily windows. A number of the walls in the house are just the sandstone colored rock, but on two different sides of the house, it's just big window window walls with the, the red panes. And it's really, really beautiful from the outside. It kind of stands out. I can see how in the wintertime when you got a lot of snow, it's just kind of like this like cozy, inviting structure that you can see just amidst all of the blinding white snow. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to their website and fun fact, if you are so interested in this house after hearing us discuss it, that you want to visit and book a stay there, it is a bed and breakfast. <gasps> Um, so you can visit the elamhouse.com and you'll be able to find all the information you need there. <laughs> Subtle plug. They don't know I'm doing this. <laughs> um, tell them I sent you. <laughs> but yeah, so on their website, they have a number of pictures of the different rooms in this house. And the room that ended up inspiring me the most was the living room. So the living room, it's a very warm, cozy aesthetic. The sandstone from the outside continues onto the inside. Ooh. So around the fireplace, it's still that same like warm sand color, beige-ish. Beige is kind of like a boring word, but like sandstone color. I'm just saying sandstone so many times that it's not going to be a word <laughs> anymore by the time I'm done saying it. Sandstone. So it, this inside, it relies a lot on these warm tones in wood with like red undertones, kind of like oaky kind of colors not really like the lighter you know maybe like a birch like that wasn't there wasn't any like light wood and it was all these like dark and really earthy tones and really warm lighting along the side that's very not harsh but very subtle just kind of illuminating the space in a very soft way but to contrast this is one of those rooms with the big open window wall ah. so when you look outside you're met with the seasons whatever season it may be so some of the pictures that they had were from winter time where the trees are bare it's white and snowy. It looks very bleak and stark outside. But inside, it's this beautiful, cozy, comforting space. Now, that's part of it. The other part is, on the outside, as I was flipping through their little pictures, they have a backyard hockey rink. What? what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is not something I expected from a Frank Lloyd Wright building, but they have a backyard hockey rink. What? I know. Why? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But I took inspiration from it because I was like, wow, that's that's out of the box. It's pretty wild. So the idea for the two dishes that I'm making based on the Elam house are the juxtaposition between the warmth and comfort felt and experienced inside versus the cold and rigid experience of being outside, just outside the window. So these two places are so close to each other, you can see in, but they're still separated. So for the dish that I concocted in my brain, but definitely didn't make because... <laughs> <laughs> because i didn't <laughs> i chose to um the dish that represents the inside is something that you could enjoy while being outside and the dish that is based on the outside is something you could enjoy while being inside Ooh. so it's like a contrasting of i'd say temperature is probably the the biggest like you know duality that i'm playing with yeah. here so the inside inspired drink is a spiced hot chocolate with a square cut homemade marshmallow and i'll get into that in a minute the uh dish based on the outside and the cold weather and the hockey rink and all this stuff <laughs> and and keeping in mind from the very beginning as i was describing the house there's the red wood paneling and detailing and the sandstone um those are things that i took into account when i was creating this outside dish um this is a raspberry and vanilla ice cream on a square cut cinnamon streusel wafer oh. for the hot chocolate i didn't want it to just be kind of like a normal hot chocolate obviously i wanted it to be a little different a little fancy for the top chef culinary universe so the idea is that it's a base of creamy oat milk because i have not had like dairy for a while and now i just don't like it anymore <laughs> so it's because like you know lactose intolerance but now i'm just like i prefer like other other 
avenues, thanks. <laughs> I don't know that you could compete in Wisconsin, actually. I might not be able to. I mean, I can still get down with cheese. Like, if it's... I can still I can still do that. Some cheese doesn't have lactose in it, depending on how long it's been like sitting, you true, know. So. True, true, true. All right, all right. Maybe I could just be like an undercover. I'm like, yeah, I love a good glass of whole milk. <laughs> and I'm just like just like pouring it over my shoulder <laughs> while I'm pretending to drink it. <laughs> They're like, who let her in here? Who is this? All right, all right, you're climbing uphill now. I didn't realize this. I didn't realize you were against anti dairy. So all right, all right, all right. I'm 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 not anti dairy. My intestines are anti dairy. <laughs> Mentally, I'm all for dairy. <laughs> it's the creamy oat milk, cocoa powder, sugar, a little bit of vanilla extract, um, and allspice. So it's kind of like a mix between just like a regular neutral hot chocolate and a Mexican hot chocolate um, or a Peruvian hot chocolate because there's they add like different like cinnamon or, you know, cloves, allspice, all these different things. So I wanted to try one with allspice in it specifically because when I was looking at the inside of the Elam house in the living room, I was just reminded of this time that I had these really like warm spiced chicken wings. <laughs> <laughs> it was like these these chicken wings that was like Caribbean jerk flavored. And so I remember loving them so much and being like, okay, I'm feeling the heat from it in like a physical, like it's a spicy dish, but I'm also getting this really nice warm flavor. It's like a different thing. It's kind of hard to differentiate sometimes, but there is a difference between like spiciness yeah. and like warmth of flavor. Yeah, Caribbean jerk, I feel like has those those two things at play. And one of the reasons for that is allspice. So allspice, allspice, what it can be likened to is a mixture of, or like a, a, a blend of nutmeg, cloves, and cinnamon. Mm -hmm. So cinnamon is something that you see from time to time in hot chocolates. You know, it's, it's a common addition, but I did want to try for that allspice to just see how that might elevate the dish and shift it a little bit from just like a warm drink to like yeah. a warm tasting drink in terms of spice um and maybe just a little bit of a kick in there too you know because you, you can't go wrong with that yeah, yeah. and then for the architecture element of this <laughs> <laughs> i feel like it might be a little bit of a cop-out but i was just thinking you know homemade marshmallows but they're like these nice chunky square cut marshmallows and just having like one big marshmallow sitting in that drink I, I that just feels like luxury you know it feels intentional and planned which is what i get from frank lloyd wright's work absolutely yeah so there's the drink and the dish representing the outside the raspberry and vanilla ice cream uh -huh. that was so you know there's like raspberry sorbet but i didn't want a sorbet i wanted something creamy so that it did match with the hot chocolate so a dairy base, dare I say. <laughs> 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 they're like would you like to try your own dish i'm like oh no please no thank you no it's all for you please i could never no <laughs> they're like what's wrong just try it i'm like no 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 please they're gonna find me out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're gonna know I'm not gonna make it to the finals yeah i, I won't <laughs> they're gonna be like we have to disqualify you automatically because you just you're lactose intolerant we can't have that in wisconsin so raspberry and vanilla ice cream pretty straightforward and then on a square cut cinnamon streusel wafer so the inspiration for that i wanted to kind of match what the square cut marshmallow had going on but in a different way because you know it's nice to have ice cream on its own but having it with a little bit of something extra something that can kind of get mixed in with a little bit of a bite that's always nice and enjoyable just a variation of texture yeah um i made these pumpkin muffins with cream cheese filling and cinnamon crumble muffins the other day yeah they sound really impressive but i was just like they were like okay <laughs> what they sound amazing <laughs> the recipe i used didn't call for pumpkin pie spice but i did use i did use like actual pumpkin i do not I will not get the pumpkin canned pumpkin. Noki knows this about me. I'm a pumpkin purist. <laughs> I will not stand for canned pumpkin. No, and that's good because canned pumpkin is actually not actually is actually not pumpkin. What? No, tell me. What? Tell me. Now. <laughs> Sweet potato. What? Sweet potato. <gasps> oh my gosh. You're welcome. Carry on. What? That's wild. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm going to be doing like a deep dive after this. I'm going to be doing so much research on the dark culinary web after this. The dark culinary web. I'm going to find all their secrets. Wow. So the cinnamon streusel, um, that's inspired by the cinnamon crumble topping from that recipe that I used. Um, it was made with, there was cinnamon, melted butter, just like a little bit of kosher salt. But it's it's this really nice kind of like crumbly crumb topping. But I wanted it in like square form. So 
when I was working with it, one of the instructions was like, oh, don't don't like squeeze this together too much. Otherwise, it'll form like a brick and like a paste. <gasps> so what I would be doing is using that, but finding like the happy medium between turning it into a paste and having it just be all falling apart. So I'd be making like probably like smaller, a smaller square, which if you want, you can say that's in contrast to the other dish where it's like a big square of marshmallow. This is like a little square of cinnamon streusel. Mm, nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. I am coming up with this on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> Just that detail. All the rest of it was planned. I spent a long time researching this. So. <laughs> oh, you're definitely. Oh, wow. I feel like I could I could sit maybe comfortably like in the middle of the Top Chef thing. I don't think I'd be eliminated, but I don't think I'd be top. <laughs> I, I'm thinking... And I know I'm saving my fire for after what would Keish do. However, I I, I believe mm. based on the episode, you you could have been at least out there with Rossica and Danny. Oh well, thank you. That's that's a big honor because they they really did a good job. Because if you had been there, then maybe you, Kevin, and mm. you know Manny might they maybe maybe would have still had a top three. Who knows? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> You're being very generous to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what would Quiche do? Quiche has done it. <laughs> but now <laughs> I am curious, though, because I do know you come to the table with a lot of experience. This is my first time being kind of like, you know, like I, I was watching this episode and I felt so sad that judges were saying like all these dishes were falling short. Nothing was hitting the mark. Everything's just kind of like not working out. We remember again that Kristen's going to tell them you have to start cooking to win. <laughs> but I want to hear your take on it and the wisdom that you bring to the table as a, a top chef viewer of, of many seasons. Um, what is it that you took from this episode? What did you see in this episode that you're, you're looking at through your unique perspective? Heesh. I'm sitting here with my spiced chocolate and square cut marshmallow drink. Thank you very much. Yummy. And my <laughs> wonderful ice cream with the streusel, the square cut streusel. Lovely. Love it. Yeah. I'm sitting here with these lovely snacks. And I hope you have them in front of you as well. And you're enjoying as, as also. Because this is going to be a slightly heavy Top Chef bag of check. Mm. <laughs> All right. Bring it. Bring it. <laughs> as, a, as a grizzled Top Chef veteran. I spent mm -hmm. much of yesterday with my fellow grizzled Top Chef vets on Reddit. <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> and you, I'd like to bring us back to when you mentioned the whole Kristen Kish having to tell the chefs, you need to cook to win. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let's hold this, hold that in your mind for a moment in your mind. So mm -hmm. the, one of the pleasures, the rare pleasures that I have and one of the reasons that I'm doing this podcast, right, is I'm having an opportunity to talk about a show that I really enjoy with someone else who I'm bringing yeah. along for the ride. I'm beginning to feel a little, and I'll get to it a little more later, I'm beginning to feel a little badly that I brought you along for this ride. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. This, is, this has been so much fun. I love seeing, like, this new kind of format <laughs> of, like, really getting to know these chefs on, like, and being invested in them. <laughs> in like an emotional level <laughs> like that's something i haven't experienced in cooking shows before and it's something that i've i've definitely really appreciated also just the challenge of trying to come up with something along with them each week let a, i'm not making it <laughs> it's challenge enough to think of it so i am having a good time do not worry at oh, all that's, that's good <laughs> you know because um well, i will say this if you survive this season which in my mind oh gosh what <laughs> You're going to be a grizzled top. You're going to be one of, you know how sometimes, you know, you'll get into some people, they go to war and they just sit at a desk and they don't see any battle and they're like, oh, it was fine. And sometimes you go to battle and you're on the mm -hmm. front line. You're on the front lines for this, for your first season. I did not expect you to be here oh, on the front lines. <laughs> I did not expect you to become a grizzled Top Chef vet in your first season of watching Top Chef. <laughs> Ooh, I'm fast, you know. <laughs> And then I don't I don't go to Reddit a whole lot. <laughs> Reddit <laughs> tends not to be a safe space if you like something. But guess what happens if you're not liking Ooh. something? <laughs> Great, space. Great space. <laughs> Great space. I'm messaging with my friend. And as we're messaging each other and I'm waiting for her responses, I'm scrolling through Reddit. And it was so funny. I said to her, you'll say something and then I'll say something and then I'll go scroll and I will literally read what you just said in the comments. <laughs> oh my like, goodness. Because 
for us grizzled top chef vets, we're all it seems like we're all mm-hmm. who are really mm. not enjoying the season. <clears throat> mm. Mm. So there's another pleasure in uh sharing mm-hmm. watching with others and so back in my younger years, way back when Top Chef was was more new, so 18, mm-hmm. 17 years ago, you would do fun <laughs> things like Top Chef drinking games. So for example, this season would be would Ooh. be every time Michelle says barbecue, take a drink. Oh, I love that. Oh my gosh. Right? You would quickly pass out, obviously. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so that's I I do miss the days of watching this. So that's one of the reasons. So, so thank you so much for joining me on this mm. journey, Keish. And you're you're gonna be you know hardened hardened top chef vet by the end of this season. <laughs> I'll be changed, whether for good or worse, is to be seen. Uh, look on the bright side, you know, top chef. And I I actually <laughs> was on Reddit trying to see what the consensus was of what the air quotes worst mm-hmm. seasons are because as <laughs> as a grizzled top chef vet of twenty seasons, you're going to have favorite and lesser favorite seasons of top chef that's fair I was, yeah. I was looking around for what the consensus was and i was actually alarmed by the number of seasons that make the least favorite and i go okay, okay 20 seasons i guess that makes sense but oh. my gosh you can't dislike okay. every season everyone <laughs> <laughs> but i will say this it seems fairly universal that seasons one and two are generally among the least liked and that's when top mm. chef is kind of finding its feet and so I will say that for you, mm. we can pretend, and because in a sense, it is a little bit of a reboot. So you, yeah, if you make yeah. it through this rocky first season, look, it can only, hopefully, fingers crossed, hopefully it can only <laughs> go up from here. <laughs> because nice. Because right now, right now, right. this season, season 21 of Top Chef is on track to be the undisputed worst season of Top Chef ever. What? Oh, yes. It is on track. Now, hey, hey, look, we're only four episodes in. It can pull out of this tailspin. It can pull out. Okay. I'm just saying. Yeah. If it keeps going in the direction that it's going. It is on track to be the worst season of Top Chef ever. Oh, man. <laughs> I had no idea. So mm-hmm. Wednesday evening when Top Chef airs, sat down and I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do what we like to call a pleasure watch. And a pleasure watch is one of those things where where if you're podcasting about a show or if you're the type of person who lets yourself be distracted and you don't actually sit down and watch something, I like to call a pleasure watch. You're going to sit, you're going to watch it. You're not going to look at your phone. You're not going to take notes. You're just going to watch the show, right? Mm. And I was really excited because I rarely have the opportunity to do a pleasure watch. I just... I just don't. Yeah. So I'm all excited. I'm like, all right. And, you know, yes, there was 50, 50 um, croquettes last week. But, you know, <laughs> episode two with the beer was pretty good. So I was really looking forward to this. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, ooh, double elimination is going to be spicy. So my first pleasure watch of the season was unfortunately not much of a pleasure. Mm. <laughs> As I'm watching and as my friend, my fellow grizzled Top Chef vet, we, we talked about this yesterday. And she said, you know, mm-hmm. I'm watching. I think she was watching a Peacock. She said, you know, I, I paused it 40 minutes in because I realized they still hadn't started cooking. And we had 40 minutes of an episode. And we still have, oh. you know, these episodes are an hour 15 minutes long now. Yeah. W- when are they going to start cooking? <laughs> so then we get to the actual elimination challenge. And, oh boy, our little chef testants. Where do I begin? So Wisconsin, you can you can still you can still do it. I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting you. The sun could still rise I'm, on the cheese state. I, because Kristen, <laughs> Kristen Kish is doing a great job and you guys are really sandbagging her for her first season and I'm not liking it. Mm, I gotta say, there was I know I'm I'm getting like a little bit like this is just like an out outstanding moment, but I just speaking to what you just mentioned about Kristen right now, I really just want to bring it up. It was so touching to me when they brought in the team that was going home and how she was getting choked up when she told them to pack their knives and go i under i know she didn't like do that on purpose to be like this is a humanizing moment but like she sincerely felt that like being a former chef testant knowing what that feels like like she was putting herself in their shoes and experiencing what that feels like to be told to go to last chance kitchen because she experienced that too and i thought that was a really really beautiful moment 
really heart wrenching too. <laughs> but I think she's doing great. I think Kristen's doing a fantastic Absolutely. job. Absolutely, and and how horrible for her. I mean, this is your first season. You're super excited. You're clearly a top mm-hmm. show fan. You've won a season yourself. And then you're coming in after several really, really strong seasons of Top Chef, like really good seasons. And now you're coming in Mm -hmm. and your first season is this is your this is your batch of chef testants here. They're so they're doing so poorly. You're not even going to have a judge's table. How how awful must she have felt? How awful. Mm -hmm. This is your first. She must have been so excited when she got that call. And now this is what this is what you're getting. And and. I, when this was happening, I honestly thought that this was going to be you, the, the you need to cook to win moment. And then mm-hmm. when the credits are rolling, I turned to my partner and I said, oh, oh, God, she didn't say. So that's still going to ha- that's still coming that she didn't that say it you yet. Need to cook to win moment <laughs> is still, which so that means that this wonderful lecture that they just it wasn't even a lecture, this wonderful pep talk that they just got fell on deaf ears mm. because at some point in the future, she's still going to have mm. to say to them. You need to yeah. cook to win. You guys are messing up my first season. Hello. This is oh. my prom. <laughs> and you're ruining it. My prom. <laughs> Top Chef season 21 is my prom. Don't mess it up for me. <laughs> so the first episode, as you know, in my mind, should have been a preliminary episode and not part of the regular season. Because we didn't get to see any creativity from the chefs. The first batch of creativity we get to see is... The second one. Right. No notes on that episode. I was thrilled. I was excited. Yay, they're doing creative stuff. Mm-hmm. No notes. Then we get to the third episode. And if we and if we pretend that episode one doesn't exist, that means that the cheese, take it cheesy, is actually episode two of them actually cooking or something, right? Mm-hmm. So now cherry challenge, great. And I actually I've gone back and rewatched it. And I was like, yeah, this is actually really good. <laughs> now if I stack that up to the to the cheese challenge, yeah. Cherry challenge fantastic <laughs> great dishes that's true i look at those dishes i, I would want to try all of those they looked great mm-hmm. i don't think there was really a dish that i was like oh ah. maybe the cabbage mm-hmm. alicia's cabbage was maybe the one dish where i, was like, I don't want to try that <laughs> or the the chocolate and beets maybe not charlie's chocolate and beets <laughs> in in past seasons if 50 chef testas choose to make a croquette they would have gotten mm-hmm. a, a talking to mm. in past seasons if a chef testant chooses to use a packaged product you can do it but you had to do a good job. So clearly, Kaylina must have done a really, really good job because you can do it. Mm-hmm. But I suspect what really happened is she did a good job. She didn't mess it up. And there were 50 croquettes. So there was just no way she was going to be in the bottom. There is no way that right. she should have been in the yeah. top unless it was truly spectacular. But she didn't really have any competition that day. Mm. Not, not really. She didn't have That's much. true. So yeah. in seasons past, so for example, just as recently as season 16 in Louisville, for the carne episode, mm-hmm. episode seven, when all the chef testants took these beautiful pieces of meat, right? Beef. They had a whole cow and mm-hmm. they reduced it to like little tartars and little tiny bites of food on a plate. And all the judges on the table mm. literally were like, where's the beef? We gave you a whole cow. <laughs> and those chefs got oh a talking goodness. to, right? Tom came back and mm-hmm. said, or somebody, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was Tom, said, why did we get two bites of beef? Where's the cow that we gave you? They all got a talking to. Yeah. That was as recently as season 16. <laughs> but but the 50 croquettes go by without any comment. Mm-hmm. No, really, no comment. No one's reaching for anything here. Yeah. No one's, and, and yes, I bet those croquettes were were delicious. Well, so, some of them. Yeah. Obviously not, obviously not Kevin. <laughs> so so I, I saw a lot of mm-hmm. a great deal on the Reddit where many like you really appreciated the moment when Kristen and Boudolo went back and talked to the chef testants and also appreciated the moment Kristen got upset mm-hmm. at the judges' table. And I appreciated that moment too. I appreciated less Boudolo and Kristen going back in the end and giving them the, the pep talk in the end because mm-hmm. I'm coming from my Top Chef baggages. I'm coming from 20 seasons of Top Chef not being afraid to tell these chef testants to do better. And we are all, mm. all of us grizzled Top Chef vets, not all of us, but most of us on the Reddit. I'm guessing the people who weren't that way are the younger fans. But as grizzled Top Chef veterans, I'm a little bit (laughs) baffled that they haven't been called to the carpet yet. How did they get away with 50 croquettes? Mm. How did she get away with at least not even a comment on her box, not even a comment on her box pasta? And it had to be because Mm. she was drowned out by 50 croquettes. How did they not get a lecture then? And then how, instead of for this episode, not only do they not receive a lecture, but they get a hug from Boudolo and Kristen Kish. Hmm. These chef testants, and again, I cannot cook. I'm not applying to be on Top Chef. <laughs> I am n- nowhere near Top Chef. 
I would be afraid of cutting. I would cut off my finger <laughs> and I would immediately <laughs> have to bow out of the competition. <laughs> you're like, thanks. That's my time, guys. I'll uh, see you later. <laughs> right. But you're here. You've you've been invited. You're among the best chefs. And you said, yes, you came on. Mm -hmm. What are these chef testants doing? And also, that aside, yeah. what are the producers doing? Mm. But I made the joke to my friend, my fellow top chef grizzled grizzled veteran. I made the joke. <laughs> Maybe Padma just took the entire production team with her when she left. Oh, geez. <laughs> because what is going on this season? Who decided to have a preliminary episode be the first episode? That's a producer decision. Hmm. Who decided to not have a quick fire? Where, when are we going to get to see the chef Tessens actually cook something? Mm. Who decided that the chef Tessens didn't need a croquette lecture? We gave you literally the best cheese in the world and this is what you did with it. You fried it. Uh, and then <laughs> another producer decision. Who decided mm -hmm. that instead of Tom coming back there and saying, hey, okay, so for example, there's another episode where Tom said to the chef testants, he said, I'm getting better food in Last Chance Kitchen. If you all do not step it up, I will bring back two chefs from Last Chance Kitchen. Ooh. They stepped it up and he didn't bring back two chefs from Last Chance Kitchen. Oh, wow. So it, 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 to us grizzled vets, why didn't they get that lecture after the croquettes? Because that's that would have prompted a lecture in any other season. Mm. Definitely after this, this, this elimination challenge, where it was so bad that they didn't even have a judge's table. That didn't prompt a lecture. That didn't prompt a, what is going on? And we're still, yeah. based on all the trailers, we're still going to get a, you need to cook to win. Yeah. What is going on with this season? Hmm. So I'm feeling really badly for Kristen Kish. Mm. She's doing a great job. Uh, yeah, I, I will give her credit. She's been incredibly compassionate toward all of the chefs and in her critiques even, like, you know, there's, there's, I, I loved it when she said there's too much cheese, you know, like, like, dare I say about like the cheese challenge, like she's, she's bringing like a lightness, but a professionalism to her role as the host of Top Chef that I'm, I'm really appreciating. And I'll, granted, I don't have anyone that I'm comparing it against because this is my first season, but I think she's handling it all very, very well. I think she's got a lot of poise. I feel so bad. Now, this is your first season, and we're only four episodes in, and I was so excited. How can how can you feel bad when I have no idea what to compare it to? I mean, so far, nobody has done anything egregious toward any other human beings in this season. Okay, so good. Good, as good. far as I can say, I'm happy. <laughs> your, your back must be groaning from all this luggage you're having to check in right now. <laughs> I have a note of dank as well. All right, all right. Let's get that note of dank. <laughs> Call back to the hops episode. Charlie receiving immunity because he teamed up with Michelle. Your thoughts? I liked it. I thought it was sweet. I thought it really fostered a sense of community and it kind of incentivized the other uh, chef testants to be smart about how they picked and who they picked as their their partners you know because like we saw a little bit of that planning and that mentality when they had to open those little doors with the the second ingredient in the cherry challenge like everyone put manny last because they're like he's the threat like he's gonna go last but as you said when we covered that episode it doesn't matter because everyone's getting a different ingredient and you don't know what it is regardless so that that instance it didn't matter who picked first and who picked last but in this instance, it did matter because you've seen the work of the other chefs and like, you know, who's going to be like, who has been consistently working hard and putting out good, good dishes and who has been falling short. And so I feel like it rewarded a smart choice because Michelle, you know, she did win immunity in the last episode and she has been consistently awarded and been putting out good things. So I think it's just I, I, I didn't mind it. I gotta say, I didn't mind it. I think it was smart. Smart on Charlie's part? I think it was smart on the part of the producers for like setting it up that way because it in, it incentivizes the chef testants to be conscientious about who they're choosing. Like right now we have a really like, there's a really good sense of camaraderie and like friendship between them. But I feel like that also could lull a, one of the chef testants, any of the chef testants into the sense of like, yeah, it doesn't matter who I pick. I can work well with all of them. But if they want to win, if they want protection, if they want safety, they have to be smart about who they're picking and say, yeah, maybe it would be fine if I went with this person. But you know who got immunity last round? That's this person. And they need to think back about who's been hitting the bar and who's been missing the mark. So I think it's it's a way of getting the chef testants to think a little more deeply. Like, it's not just about the friendships that I'm making here, which they're wonderful. <laughs> it's great. I love friendship. But thinking in a competitive term, 
getting them to say, okay, yeah, they're all my friends, but I am still competing against them. And I need to figure out what's going to benefit me and my chances in this competition the best. Mm. And it was rewarded. You know, Charlie got immunity for it. Mm. So this is a little bit of, of a lead in to the immunity check because it ultimately ended up not mattering. Mm -hmm. Ultimately ended up not mattering. Right. However, right. many of us Top Shop Grizzled veterans <laughs> for double, mm -hmm. for team, uh, for, for team challenges, typically the immunity does not convey and that adds an element that adds a level of spice to it, right? Because the other person could be mm -hmm. eliminated mm -hmm. and you're really at risk here. And another thing is if it's yeah. a double elimination, it doesn't have to be two people from the same team, right? They could have eliminated oh, okay. X and X. They can do whatever they want, right? Mm -hmm. And also for us veterans, we don't appreciate when it seems like someone's coasting Right now, Charlie's riding in the middle, so he's a little bit coasting, and he definitely, mm -hmm. definitely coasted by partnering with Michelle, right? So, immunity check mm -hmm. for this week's immunity check. I was thinking about this, and them having the immunity before an elimination, mm -hmm. on the one hand, that seems pretty fair, because eliminations are pretty tough, so you win immunity. But what's happening for me as a viewer is the drama of the immunity is all drained from the episode, because... You had to think back to who won immunity before, but you also have to think back to who might have won it. Hmm. So, for example, do you remember the episode two where they had to elevate beer snacks? Yes. Do you remember who was in the top three? I'm going to be so honest. No, I do not. <laughs> exactly. No, 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 no. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I forgot too until I went back and looked. Kenny was in the top three as well. Hmm. Now, I thought about this and I said, huh. If he had won, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have been eliminated in the cheese challenge. Hmm. But because I didn't remember when I was watching the cheese challenge, you didn't remember how many other people remembered. It drained all the drama from that, from that elimination. Hmm. So in the olden days, you, you knew mm -hmm. whoever was going into that elimination, who was at, who was on the chopping block, who was safe. Yeah. Now you had to remember, mm. and I didn't remember who else was in the top three until I went back and looked. Right, right. So that actually drained a lot of the drama from that cheese elimination because <laughs> I forgot that Kenny had been in the top and if he had won, huh. he would have been safe and Manny or Kevin would have gone home. Mm. By having the elimination tied to the episode before, it drains all the drama. Yeah. For, right? You win immunity. Yeah, I can see that. When I was watching that elimination, I would have felt, oh my gosh, if only Kenny had won. Right, because he's my man. Now, do you remember who was in the top? Well, pro you probably remember because, <laughs> but in the top of the cheese challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Kalina, Michelle, and Spacing on that last one. <laughs> if Kalina had won with her boxed pasta, she wouldn't have gone home, mm. and Alicia wouldn't have gone home. Mm. Which begs the question: Yeah, who would have gone home instead for this week's challenge? Man, I don't know. I'd say maybe Amanda and Dan are safe, and then Manny, Kevin, Michelle, Charlie, and Laura Savannah are the bottom. I think. Yeah, I think that sounds right. Manny gets saved by Kevin. He nets out with Kevin. Hmm. So I think that leaves us with Michelle and Charlie and Laura and Savannah. And I, looking at this, and if we're just talking failing on technique, mm -hmm. nobody really, on Laura and Savannah's team, they didn't really fail on technique that much. They need a little acid. Laura's dish was a little too sweet. Right. But Michelle and Charlie failed on technique completely. Yeah. So I, I look at this and I, and I think, and I, I was thinking about this and we're losing some drama in the episodes. I and mean, you and I just had to sit here and think about this for a minute mm -hmm. because we can't remember who actually was in the top the previous episode. Right. That would have added drama to the cheese elimination and it would have added drama to this elimination as well. If I could remember who had won that challenge, mm -hmm. I would have been like, oh my gosh, Kalina was this close to not being eliminated, but I completely forgot. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. That's my, that's, and that's another, a, a bit, <laughs> all this baggage. Oh my gosh, my back, <laughs> my back. <laughs> Get it on the plane quick. I just oh can't carry it anymore. <laughs> so Rasika wins immunity for another week. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can remember that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and at least for next week, we won't have to remember who else was on the top. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just Danny. <laughs> <laughs> so if he's in the bottom next week. It's just him. That's a, that's another producer decision mm -hmm. that initially I thought, oh, sure. And most of us thought our gut reaction, well, that's fair for an elimination. But it's really draining yeah. much needed drama from these episodes, in my opinion. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That's my immunity. That's that's the immunity check for this week. That's my Top Chef baggage check. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to need a walking cane after this. Yeah. 
Do you have any do you have any last tidbits for this elimination challenge? I am so sorry. <laughs> you know what? I I do actually, and it, it pertains to um it pertains to Rosica, our little ray of Aww. sunshine. As you know, I like pulling quotes every once in a while from the episode, and so I pulled a quote from her that I would like to read. This is when she was talking about how exciting it is to see her her cooking and this this tradition of culinary expertise that she has grown up with these different flavors and style of cooking, seeing these things that her grandmother taught her, being appreciated and loved and winning acclaim and accolades and stuff in, in the Top Chef cinematic universe, um, all these things. So about that, she said, my grandma is always guiding me like ratatouille on my head. Oh. And I loved that so, so much. Me too. <laughs> It's so cute because I can just picture her with like a tall chef's hat and like, a <laughs> like I don't know what her grandmother looks like, but like a mini version of her grandmother just like sitting on her head, just being like, yeah, and some more of that spice. <laughs> right. Oh, I, yes. Love. Love Rossica. And, mm -hmm. and of course, she continues to be in the top four. No question. The top four, just in case mm -hmm. you're wondering, and I bet you're not, because guess what? Top four hasn't changed. And right. Rossica, just points wise, is ahead by a mile. If she does not win, this is going to go down as my least favorite, se second least favorite oh, season. Oh, gosh. <laughs> because at this point, it's 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 really looking like her season to lose. Unless it's Danny or Michelle or Dan, right? Mm. Because those have been the consistent top four. Right. If, if one of those doesn't win, it'll be a, whoa, what really happened this season? But also, if one of those wins, it'll be like a, wow, they didn't have any competition this season. So it's going to be... It'll be interesting to see how it plays out, that's for sure. Those are, you're in my top four based on points. Those are Buddha Lowe's top four. Everyone, every article I read, they're everyone's top four. And why are they everyone's top four? It's because it's so glaringly obvious who the top four is. And that shouldn't be happening mm. four episodes into it, three episodes in. This was everybody's top four two episodes in. This is not, this should not be happening. Yeah. So, cause, right, so early and consistently in the season. Yeah, yeah. Dan, Michelle, Manny, and Rosica. Yeah, everyone's top four. And I bet they're Pack Your Knives top four as well, because mm. who else? Yeah, yeah. Kristen, top four. She's going to win this Top Chef <laughs> season. Right. I'm so sure of she it. She may come out the only winner of this season. Yeah, she's actually not just the top. She's not just number one. She's top four. Like, she occupies all those spaces, actually. So right. for those of you who are curious, this is Kristen's <laughs> season. <laughs> <laughs> it so is oh my gosh and so Budolo is he is the goat and to see him have to look at these that must have been one of the least pleasant dinners on top chef because they edited so much of it and my guess is they didn't have a anything kind to say that must that, that, that must have been such a disappointing dinner mm. right usually they have this lively conversation and they show so much they didn't show anything yeah they, they showed one comment from gail yeah she's a food writer oh geez yeah no that that is rough speaks volumes to what must have happened at that table i didn't think about that yeah i mean i'm able to carry on some pretty good conversation over like a frozen microwave <laughs> dinner but like i get it i get it <laughs> but now you're judging that microwave dinner and you have to say nice things about it now i'm judging that microwave dinner oh man i don't know <laughs> and we're cutting judges table this episode no judges table <laughs> so do you have any tidbits from this this elimination challenge just a couple it's unfortunate that they telegraphed so early on who was going to be in the top and who was going to be in the bottom, but maybe they just didn't have anything to work with. Mm. But I did think it was right awkward, but funny, funny awkward. The whole Gemini being a bad sign. Oh, oh gosh, that was painful. <laughs> oh, and she's like, women are different though. Gemini women are different though. <laughs> so much awkward I mean, from the get go. I like, know. What? Wait, why did you two partner up? <laughs> It's no, because I think it was because they were just standing yeah. next to each other. And that's why I thought it was good that like, you know, some of the other ones were like picking out specifically, like making these choices. So, man, it's just, <laughs> well, yeah. They were in the interview and I think Kaylina or or Alicia, one of them actually touched the other one's foot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, producers, why did you leave that in? Why? You're telegraphing so obviously that they cannot stand one another. I know. I'm wondering, I kind of have a hunch. I feel like we're going to see one of those two back from LCK. I Alicia has been someone that I have been keeping my eye on. She was like the first chef test and I did research into when we started this out. Um, and I thought she had a really fascinating background and she has a really like powerful presence, I think. Like she knows what she wants. She's going to go get what she wants. But obviously like working in a team setting was a more difficult thing as she was expressing they were both saying like someone has to take lead here we can't both be taking lead 
like it's conflicting it doesn't work so i'm curious to see how lck treats her and and how she gets along there <laughs> i will say nothing however i i will say as someone who had her side eye on the the con- chef testants of asian descent i'm down too Mm. Oh, I only got Rasika left. <laughs> You're like, no. <laughs> but don't worry. It's still Kristen's season. Don't worry. <laughs> She's still winning. <laughs> and then my other tidbit is mm-hmm. when I say the phrase power bottoms, what does that mean to you? Oh, gosh. I don't know. Can I skip past <laughs> next question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. All I'm going to say about that is it lit up the ether sphere and the, and the best best possible way oh my gosh (laughs) it made the reddit a wonderful place to visit (laughs) and depending the top chef inspired team names (laughs) Mm -hmm. so depending on your point of view it's either a very good or a very bad nickname and that's all i'm gonna say about it (laughs) either way you're gonna laugh though (laughs) oh yes oh yes those are my tidbits all right, so it looks like it's just about time for snack time, Woo-hoo. which means we are inviting high-speed dining back to the table. All right, well, we would like to get into snack time now. You know him, you love him. High-speed dining is back. Welcome back. <laughs> Good to be back, guys. Here we are. Let's talk food. And Top Chef. <laughs> What's been Joel's best bite this week, High Speed Danny? Mm. Uh, this week I went to a restaurant in D.C. called Opal. Uh, it's by the Nina May people. Star dish of the meal, though, was a lobster pasta. Lobster ravioli. Big, thick uh, pasta, the dough, and it was stuffed with uh, lobster, but it had a cheesy texture to it, so it was really nice and uh, quite enjoyable. I scarfed that down. Yeah, that's like a perfect al dente. Really good chew to this to this lobster ravioli. It was really good. Ooh. Would you try yeah. Quiche's charcuterie board mm. flavor stuffed ravioli pasta? Yeah, it's pear and pecorino romano cheese ravioli with, I think I said rosemary butter and crushed roasted pecans on top. Oh. I've got that Homer Simpson drool happening right now. I'm honored. Uh, Yeah, that sounds great. You know, I'll try anything twice. Okay. The first time is, well, the first time is like, am I really understanding what I'm eating? Mm. Uh, The second time is like, well, yeah, that was as good as I thought, or it wasn't as good. Third time, it's, you know, shame on me if I eat bad food a third time. (laughs) (laughs) In honor of this week's episode about dualities, Mm. what would be, say, for example, and this question could be for both of you, your favorite food duo, foods that you would eat together? I love all foods, but a surf and turf is always fun. I mean, that's a, Mm. you know, I'm not picky. Again, it's all in the hands of the chef. Give me a crappy chef, and I don't even want to eat my favorite foods. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> True. Fair. Well, Keish, what about you? Any favorite food duo? This is an interesting one. I'm going to bring up, I guess, a food crime, but it's not one that I've committed. And I'm not sure if it's a crime because I haven't tried it. Um, a friend of mine swears by pickles and peanut butter. Oh. Interesting. Whoa. And she says it's it's like one of those really unexpected but really good combinations. And I I know I, my reaction at first, I was like, I don't know. Never tried it, but I've thought about it for a while. And I'm like, I wonder how it really does taste. So actually, I might do that after we stop recording <laughs> and circle back <laughs> next episode. <laughs> I've never thought of that because I've never been pregnant. It seems like that's a- Well, neither has she. Pregnant... <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it just seems like a pregnant dish. I don't know why, right? This is, I mean, there's certain things pregnant people eat, right? Pregnant women. I don't know. I haven't been pregnant either. <laughs> Me either. That's how magic happens. Yeah, you, you cram things together that accidentally uh, may or may not like peanut butter and a pickle. Yeah. Who would have thought of that? But turns out maybe that is a great thing to maybe do. Maybe it is. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I'll let you know next week. <laughs> <laughs> I think peanut butter would work with everything. It's a spread, you know. It's I think that would That's be true. a perfect thing to put on stuff. Hmm. I'm gonna come up with some combinations this week. I'm gonna like like I took a rigatoni and then I <laughs> stuck it in a tomato salad and then I oh, poured what? caramel on top. <laughs> I am, and you know what? I'm intrigued. <laughs> yeah, you, you never know. 
please try my tomato caramel rigatoni. Yes. Yes. That's going to bring the kids to the yard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> give us give us what we want. We, You know what we want. Give it to us. Don't be cowards. <laughs> <laughs> we want cheesier, too. I want to see some real... Mm crazier cheese things going on i know i do i do hope they have more cheese stuff coming up because if it's just the one episode and like we were talking about this it was all croquettes like we want to see some more cheese in some different yeah. forms <laughs> bringing it back to top chef did you know that your man your pick for this season dan the man he's still in the top four very good go dan mm -hmm. so when they were introducing the chef testants this year they mentioned that he has five james beard or world not nominations and i remember mm -hmm. thinking oh that's interesting because in the, my research it says he has six but that's because six happened this year he's your man Dan is a finalist this year for Best Chef Midwest. Six times. That's a lot of nominations. Yeah. God bless him. I, I researched him a little bit this week. Yeah, he seems to be doing good. I wish him well for this. Yeah. Good for Dan. Yeah. I'm enjoying Top Chef and seeing what's going on and watching this stuff happen. And what's the topic for the next week? Do you know? Have they announced it? All I know, based on the preview, is that they have to buy their ingredients before they know what the challenge is. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> so with that said, they, they're going to go to their comfort foods and mm, comfort yeah. ingredients and things like Ooh. that, their strengths. That's about it. I'm having a great time watching the show, Top Chef. I'm getting into it. You, with the competition, you, you want to stick around and see where it's all going. So Yeah. Well, it's great. We enjoy hearing your input every week. I enjoy talking and listening to myself. So this works out for both of us. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. It's perfect then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it. And that's it for snack time. Thank you, High Speed Dining. We will look forward to having you next time. Thank you. All right. So that brings us to the conclusion of that episode. I think it's high time we uh, we put Noki out of her misery and hopefully look toward a brighter future. Um, it was a fascinating challenge that they had, mixing architecture and using that to inspire cuisine. So, you know, we'll we'll take what we got from this episode and we'll we'll look forward to that bright future, the sun rising over the over the expanse of Lake Michigan. <laughs> Look, I said to myself, you're going to get all the baggage out on this episode. I promise in the future, I will say, please listen to my rant on episode four. I'm not going to weigh down every episode with this level of baggage check. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I will just say, once again, the teaser has me excited mm. for next week. They have to buy their ingredients before they know the challenge. Oh my gosh. Stressful. <laughs> Ooh. So I'm excited. I'm also nervous because I still know that hanging out there is Kristen's now infamous you need to cook to win lecture. I know. Uh, oh my gosh. We're still waiting for that. Uh, Oof. Jeez. The anticipation is what's getting me the most. <laughs> <laughs> On a lighter note, do you have any tasty morsels for us today, Quiche? You know what? I do. I do. I have a little tasty morsel. This is this is like a peaceful kind of like ASMR almost foodie thing. So Ooh. the person I'm bringing to the table today, this is a internet personality. Um, she has a YouTube. She has TikTok. She's definitely on Instagram as well, but I, I primarily, primarily see her on YouTube. Her name is Emily Mariko, and she is known for uh salmon bowls that's where she first became popular um this was like in 2021 when like salmon bowls were becoming like a really big thing but she always makes these these youtube shorts that i watch from her there's never any talking but she's always just makes these really like quiet but very peaceful videos just showing her like food prep different things so she'll get out like the one that I just saw recently, like right before we started recording this, she made a cucumber salad. So she had four cucumbers. She washed them. She used one of those, um, do they, they call it like a mandolin. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Like a mandolin slicer. Yeah. And so she just sliced four of those into this big bowl and she added, I think it was some salt and um, like a couple other like seasoning spices um, and some sauce and she just mixed it up. And then it always ends with her just like taking a bite of it and being like, yeah, that's good. And it's just such a comforting channel to watch. So if you're looking for some food inspiration, typically like generally always really healthy and really realistic too. She makes a lot of um, sheet pan meals where she's put like, you know, mixed veggies on the pan as well as some chicken or some salmon, these different things. Um, all of her recipes, I would say, 
you could kind of just see what they are. You don't really need to read anything about them and be like, yeah, I could probably replicate that in a way that would be unique to me, but would still taste good. Oh. If you're looking for looking for a, a good little tasty morsel this week to binge on, Emily Mariko, definitely a great one. I like that. So the satisfying ASMR sounds of cooking and all those things. And mm-hmm. this is a good tasty morsel. Yeah. How about you? You got anything for us? I have a few. These are these may be more Top Chef leftovers. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Okay. Somehow I missed this in the cheese episode. <laughs> and you may have caught it. Kevin's quote where he said that Top Chef America is actually harder than Top Chef France. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I saw that later in print when I was researching. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a great quote. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It's a funny one. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> the full quote is, here at Top Chef America, I feel like it is way, way harder than Top Chef France for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then... This is another Top Chef leftover. So David Murphy, the chef testant who left in the first episode, Mm -hmm. who did not appear in Last Chance Kitchen. Yeah. From what I can see out there in the ether sphere, (laughs) he opted out. Or maybe he didn't opt out, but it seems like maybe he probably opted out Hmm. and just chose not to compete. That I... But hmm. uh, this is not truly confirmed, but that's what I'm seeing out in the ethosphere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Jeez. So that those are my tasty morsels for today. Oh, thank you for that, Noki. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you for listening this time. If you'd like to find our other episodes, as this is our fourth episode, you can look for us on social media at Food and Dine or Food and Dine Podcast. And you can listen to us wherever you listen to your podcast. We drop every Sunday after Top Chef airs. We will see you next time. Welcome to the table. Let's eat.